uh, resilience, uh, you know, uh, it's it's becoming a buzzword. Yeah, I don't know. Someone uh, was asking uh, whether resilience is becoming the word of the century, but probably not about this, uh, not not of the century, but for sure of the decade, and uh, especially after uh, Corona uh, virus crisis. Uh, terms uh, such as resilience or vulnerability or sensitivity or crisis and crisis management and handling and dealing with crisis uh, are becoming very, very important uh, issues. Resilience as a starting point, or let me more say vulnerability uh, as a starting point, in, just in order to discuss uh, uh, different levels of resilience. We all realize, especially in this crisis, that social, economic, cultural and political uh, systems are uh, very vulnerable. We felt uh, ourselves in a way vulnerable. We were not prepared, uh, uh, but the world found a way uh, to remain in a way also stable. Uh, nevertheless, we became sensitive uh, for crisis, economic, financial, demographic, climate crisis, uh, so, uh, just in order to, to, to name some of the crises. And more and more, uh, we uh, become aware of the fact, or we, we have an idea, we become an idea of the fact that it is not one crisis, but a couple of crises influencing our everyday life and influencing uh, the different social, economic, cultural, and political levels. The book, uh, which uh, will be uh, discussed today, is dealing exactly about these issues. Uh, yeah. So on one hand, the crisis, on the other hand, the multi-resilience, the resilience uh, based on uh, different uh, viewpoints, uh, which will be discussed uh, this afternoon by uh, different uh, personalities, experts uh, in, that, uh, in that field. Allow me uh, to uh, come now to the first speaker. I announced him, uh, Professor Roland Benedicta. He will uh, make an introduction uh, in the book. He is the co-head of the Center for Advanced Studies. Uh, he is uh, an expert and uh, it's really, really impressive was, uh, what he, together with Karim Fati, um, prepared uh, uh, in, in terms of, of a dimension of a book, uh, an intensive book, uh, discussing the current uh, situation. Really, really impressive. And so I hope you will uh, uh, you will like uh, this uh, two hours uh, together. Uh, without uh, without going to other details, I'd like to give uh, now uh, the floor uh, to uh, Professor Roland uh, Benedict. Yeah, thank you very much, Harald, for the kind introduction. Thank you all for being uh, with us uh, tonight. We want to present a book, The Coronavirus Crisis and Its Teachings. I hope you can see uh, my presentation. Uh, what we have tried to do is to come to a critical review of the coronavirus crisis from a Sorry, social... Uh, Roland, Roland. We, we cannot see your presentation yet. Okay, so let me try it again. Okay. Now you should see it. Can you see it? Yeah, how about yep. Bildschirm version, perfect. Okay. Perfect. Wonderful. Sorry for this. So what we tried is to write a book about the coronavirus crisis um, and to uh, delineate some steps towards a use of this crisis for progress. So if you want our departing question was perhaps naive because our question was can there be anything positive about and out of this crisis? And um, the prerequisite to, under, to, to answer such a, um, a question is to understand the main traits of this crisis uh, which implies the goal or implicit in the goal that to provide the primordial social sciences view of the coronavirus crisis. Now, um, as enthusiastic as um, Karim and I were entering this challenging uh, research endeavor, uh, as soon 
we were um, we became aware that there are uh, infinite problems inbuilt in such an endeavor. For example, the infinite number of elements and views to consider, the difficulty of the integration to the to, to uncertainty, diversity of positions and contradictions, not least among the numbers and among the interpretations. Um, that the process is not finished and the crisis is ongoing, but also that we had to consider the open, medium and long-term outcome in full flux. We are still in the midst of the pandemics, technically speaking, although it is coming to an end, as it seems. Nevertheless, to write about something that may perhaps have long-term consequences is a huge challenge. The result uh, was that we aimed at providing elements not for static, but for current and future process learning. That means to find elements up for work in progress now and in the future. Now, to, to do this, we um, started with considering complexity. We today speak at least of six topological dimensions, also societal macro logics, which also correspond to uh, social discourse patterns um, that we have to consider if we want to approach a micro problem, a systemic problem as the pandemic was in a sufficiently complex, adequate way. And here we had to consider the macro topological logics of economy, politics, culture, religion and spirituality, technology and demography. And among the huge fields to be inquired were governance, the resilience topic that Harold mentioned, connected with the sustainability discourse, but also issues of knowledge, of cultural preparedness, of ecosystems, and not least of new technologies. As you know, we together uh, with other uh, developments, the pandemic uh, in instilled basically uh, a new technological age of vaccines that are now based on new experimental procedures that we still didn't have, and many uh, argue that this is uh, a, a huge step in man-machine convergence towards new technologies that will uh, be um, entering the human body, which, we, which will uh, modify the human body in just in, instead of just treating um, a virus or a disease. Now, the starting elements that uh, Karim and I were confronted with were a, a, a huge, huge number of unexplored issues and of influences and dimensions to consider. Of crucial importance uh, was, first of all, the data competition and the related interpretations. Uh, are there reliable data? Not so much. We, we have produced uh, more data about the coronavirus crisis over the past years than on many or most other issues. But if you consider that there is still the question, as The Economist just a few months ago published, are there 5.1 million deaths or 17.3 7 million deaths? The Economist itself says the most probable number is between 10 and 20 million deaths if you consider all the side effects and the long-term consequences. So with what are we dealing with? Where are the data? Where are the facts? not considering the whole thing uh, and, and dialogue about um, uh, fake news or, or uh, conspiracy theories, but where, where are the reliable facts? Second, ideologization. We had uh, a huge wave of criticism of governmental mandates and state power, for example, by George Agamben Ben and other postmodern critics. But we also had a critique of neoliberal state application and governmental rollback, uh, so that states and nations and governments were uh, less prepared uh, to confront the crisis uh, than uh, many would have expected, exactly because of the retreat of the state in neoliberal times. We had the question of commercialization and marketization. There were industrial interests involved, of course, of the pharma industry, but also of other industries 
they shouldn't be overestimated, but they shouldn't, uh, on the other hand, not underestimated either. We had the systemic competition and propaganda, the question of rivaling systems. We had indeed an efficiency competition between authoritarian versus open societies. Uh, remember uh, what China did in trying to prove to its own population, but also to the world, that a closed system, an authoritarian system, is much more efficient in handling a pandemic or even a systemic crisis than an open society where many voices compete and many interpretations can freely um, um, encounter each other. So Corona became also a kind of advertising tool for alleged systemic supremacy, especially from the side of authoritarian versus open systems. Then there was the rise of ecosystems and their views, the consideration of social political ecosystems varied according to systems, context and history. So every situation is different, even if you have an open society or have a liberal society, it is not the same like a liberal society that is neighboring you because it has a slightly other different demography, it has other components, it has another system, a history, and perhaps its interpretation of capitalism uh, and its developmental markers were different. So every single ecosystem is different and has their own typologies and characteristics. So how, how to come to an overarching uh, encompassing view. And last but not least, the in limited inter and transdisciplinary research reflexivity with which we were confronted, um, we still had, and that was one of the biggest teachings right from the start of the coronavirus crisis, a dominance of sectorial views, not only on problems, but also on crisis and on the rem remedy of crisis, uh, which means on resilience. In view of the next crisis, Karim and I came to the conclusion as a prerequisite of, of writing the book that we needed uh, to write something in use of the crisis to improve research reflexibility in preparation of upcoming new um, pandemics or other crises. Now, as you may grasp and, and sense, um, this situation of departure uh, was as exciting as it was complex and difficult. So we tried to come to an overarching key question to open our investigation. And we took it in essence from Jan Neder and Peter. So Jan is a good friend uh, at the University of California at Santa Barbara. He published in 2021 um, a breakthrough article, in my view, learning from COVID three key variables in the journal Protosociology, edited by him and uh, particularly by our former global fellow, Manfred Steger. And there he said, in his view, um, an appropriate overall key question would be what are the major variables that affect societies in systemic crises such as the COVID 19 pandemic? What are the major variables that affect societies in systemic crisis, such as the COVID-19 pandemic? Now, um, and he came to the conclusion there were ma three main variables. First, knowledge uh, that allows you to deal with the crisis. Second, state capability. What can the governments do? And the sub-governments, multi-level governance. And third, what is the degree of social cooperation of a society to master such a crisis. And as Jan told us, if one of these elements of these variables is dysfunctional or absent, the COVID-19 performance suffers, the variables work best in combination. So if you have knowledge, state capability and social cooperation combined. Now, Jan then went a little bit further and said, well, which types of society uh, have best combined these three variables during the crisis. Um, this could be a path to follow in, in, in then in, in ju to, to judge the overall process that we went through. Now, um, Jan came to the conclusion that liberal um, societies in average did a poorer job than state-led market economies, as he said, 
because he's he's of the opinion that state-led market economies, not too liberal, but not too close, tend to generate the best combination of variables and public health outcomes, while liberal market economies and right-wing populist countries produce the worst combination. Um, a second thesis of Jan has been that the comparative research we have uh, to date in the area points that we must renew uh, the research capacities and the research approaches and this concerns us as social scientists. We have limitations of micro theories and methodological nationalism as he calls it and we have the importance of the unit of analysis and databases that are shared that are that are uh, that are uh, uh, acknowledged uh, jointly and so what his learnings are in essence is that first of all we need an intermediate approach from the uh, view of the three variables but we also need a better research approach to the crisis itself to understand its processes and to anticipate future crises. Now to make it short and to finish Jan's impulse that he gave us at the start of writing the book is that he said learning from COVID includes avoiding macro theories and one size fits all paradigms of globalization. Uh, we should look for new combinations uh, of the components that constitute uh, social investigation into complex social processes like the pandemic. And second, Varieties of market economies offer fundamental guidance, but carry an institutional bias that doesn't quite match the rapid motions of politics, policies, and cultural shift in dealing, in dealing with a pandemic, which are short-term, very fast occurring, uh, zigzagging and embedded in past dependent political economies. So we have to understand um, complex crises like COVID by an analysis in multiple time frames simultaneously. Multi, the, 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 the concept of multi has to rise as an answer to this complex systemic crisis. And third and last, um, Jan, of course, as we all are, is opposed to methodological nationalism in considering pandemic responses. Uh, he says this doesn't work because it ignores regional differences. And I think this is quite obvious and the crisis has, has made it absolutely clear. Now, in response to these prerequisites, um, and this, this is everything I, I have to say about this, although the process was slightly more complex, uh, we wrote the book, The Coronavirus Crisis and Its Teachings, Steps Toward Multi-Resilience, and we departed from a very si si simple uh, assumption which is that before this crisis, which was really a global, penetrative, all-encompassing systemic crisis, which unified humanity also to a certain extent, like no other crisis, a few other crises before in, in the way it did. Before Corona, we departed, uh, most concept of a resilient society, a society that can withstand uh, complex crises that can deal with them implied a rather isolated focus on only one crisis at a time. Future preparedness, that is our thesis in the 21st century, will require a more multi and transdisciplinary risk management concept, which we try to call multi resilience. Here you have the word multi. We don't need resilience segmented in specialized sectors. We also need that and will continue to need that even more in the future because even the sectorial crisis become more complex and become uh, qualitatively more elevated. But what we need is a, a unification and integration of different resilience concepts uh, that we call multi-resilience, make societies multi-resilient and this in turn uh, is um, requiring a new research approach, an offensive in interdisciplinary um, research that is exactly what Jan also asked for in his, um, in his um, path-breaking paper. 
With multi-resilience, we mean to systematically enhance universal resilience competencies of societies, such as collective intelligence or overall responsiveness and being applicable to pluridimensional crisis contexts. And our probably very naive um, conclusion of the book is if the coronavirus crisis in retrospect will have contributed to implement multi-resilience, then it will ultimately have contributed to progress. Now, if this is the content of a book, we have then tried to elucidate this, to exemplify this through 50 single chapters that we have structured then in a couple of major parts. And we have tried to be as broad as possible to include as many issues as uh, we could from uh, the different conspiracy theories in the intellectual rhetoric between humanistic appeal and kitsch to the whole discourse how much technology can help us to overcome future crises how 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 to which extent it should even be merged with the human body uh, to create a new human being, a transhuman being in order to withstand future viruses. We have uh, um, addressed issues uh, such as if the environmental crisis, the, the crisis of our climate had uh, benefited from uh, the standstill uh, that was triggered by Corona but also uh, the simultaneousness of local, national and global effects, which was unprecedented and led to whole new specialization fields like, for example, medical diplomacy uh, or uh, the uh, misuse of the fake news narrative for geopolitical and other discourses. Think about the mutual accusations between the United States and China who was the origin and who did what uh, in order to, to um, make use of it for geopolitical power um, um, aspirations. We, in essence, then came to the concept of multi-resilience, which we uh, think is connected in essence to the rise of crisis bundles, that there are no single sectorial crisis anymore in our century, but that as much as civilization is proceeding and advancing, we will always see more crisis bundles or bundled crises that require a new model of multi-resilience, but also of multi-dimensional research integration. And if you want to go towards a post-corona world, which we seem now rising, uh, we have to forge a new post-corona policy design that integrates innovative um, uh, strategic uh, patterns, but also new methodological approaches. Uh, and one of these approaches will be not only multi-resilience as its own nascent uh, discipline, but especially also futures literacy, an approach that UNESCO, Real Miller, has uh, um, developed over the past decade, which means being mentally prepared to future options, to options uh, of societal uh, or even civilizational um, disruptions or evolutions um, in the present. So to be prepared to deal with different options. And I think the issue of futures literacy being literal uh, uh, literate in, in um, using the future for the present is uh, a crucial capacity that is at uh, the basis of most other dimensions, probably even of multi-resilience itself. So the conclusions are first that we must proceed from a view of single crisis to systemic crisis, which we also call crisis bundles or bundled crisis. And that means we must proceed in, its, in our approaches to research these crises in order to prevent them 
from concepts of resilience towards multi-resilience. We've also learned that all this, one major outcome of the crisis, is also to proceed from globalization to concepts of re- or post-globalization. We prefer the term re-globalization. That means that together with a more multidisciplinary and multifaceted approach to crisis, we have also rethink the very concept of globalization itself, which was at the heart in theory and in practice of this crisis, uh, and to make it more sustainable, more resilient, and more local, that means to reconcile it with the very different ecosystems and regional um, and needs and realities on the ground. Um, and this means we must reform globalization as much as we reform social sciences research and as much as we um, reform the concept of resilience. There are remaining questions in our view, and that's my conclusion, um, is that we need new concepts of inquiry together with the integration of existing ones. And some of the most important in my view and in our view are futures literacy, participatory solution building and the mobilization of collective wisdom, which will be explained by uh, Karim in just a second. The two central questions remaining are how can societies prepare for unpredictable bundled crisis and crisis bundles and what are the chances for progress in the aftermath of this crisis? Now, as Harata said, it is uh, clear that the crisis has made us more aware and more open for a vast variety of approaches. And I think this is one of the biggest benefits. We should keep that. We should continue to try to observe interrelations and terminological circuits between parts and holes. And we should try to establish and further evolve inter and transdisciplinary approaches to resilience and to future preparedness. And perhaps last but not least, we should meditate about doing nothing. There was a very nice land art project in Bolzano in our town where we, uh, where our research is residing. And um, at the peak of the crisis, and there were all the mandates and the restrictions and the lockdowns, uh, the land artist um, did his work and uh, depicted the whole crisis, summarized it in just two words, do nothing, catching the whole paradox on, um, of a new age, a new systemic uh, constellation um, triggered by the crisis. So do nothing, uh, contradiction in itself could perhaps be what we should think about a little bit better. And you see here um, how fast a pandemic, pandemic comes and how fast it disappears. It was in 25 April that we had this land art project and two months later, it was already gone by the work of nature. I would like to thank in the name of us authors, Roland Psena, the um, president of URAC, who gave us very precious advice uh, on the project. Jan Nederven Pietersen, who wrote the foreword of a project and inspired us a lot uh, in our endeavors. Manfred Steger, who is one of the leading global scholars, uh, who wrote the afterword and also gave us much of advice. And of course, the reviewers, endorsers, and friends, Uwe Schneiderwink, Louis Klein. Nico Pech, Andrea Billy, Werner Mittelstedt, and James Giordano of Georgetown University. Thank you very much. And now I give my word back to Harald Bechlerer.